The Devastated Vineyard Part 3 Chapter 4 Continued It consists precisely in the fact that intimate things are experienced as intimate and are withdrawn from the public eye, that man is coarse and superficial, hollowed out as a person, who never experiences shame, whether one praises his virtues publicly in his presence, or makes his vices known, or above all drags into the public his intimate life, his deep feelings, and especially that which is connected with the sensual or sexual sphere. He also loses all his charm, everything mysterious about him, and forfeits all personal depth. There is, of course, the sheer perversion of exhibitionism, wherein a public display is made of sexual things. The shamelessness is, in this case, limited to the sexual sphere. It does not have a dull, neutralized, or depersonalized character, but rather that of something disgusting and embarrassing. But the shamelessness is not the specific danger which we are speaking of here. It is more widespread today than in former times. The exhibitionist wants to show himself precisely to a stranger because he is conscious of the intimate nature of the sexual sphere and finds a perverse satisfaction precisely in the exposition of the intimate as well as in the shock which he brings in the other person with whom he has no inner relationship whatever. No, we are thinking of the general shamelessness of the man who never experiences shame, of the dull man who discusses intimate things in public as though they were neutral matters, of the man for whom life and the world have become a laboratory. He speaks about sexual things, even when they touch his own person, as one would talk in public about the weather. He neutralizes everything. This is the tendency of our time, and an essential characteristic of depersonalization. How beautiful, how noble, how charming is the blushing of a young girl in certain situations. It is inconceivable that so much of human life is being destroyed today under the title of science. Even some bishops are completely blind to the catastrophe of depersonalization and the destruction of the natural sources of human happiness, reaching all the way to supernatural life. They see those who fight against this abomination as prudish, reactionary, merely clinging to what is customary, what they are used to. It is truly incomprehensible how much one hears of the progress of our time in sermons, pastoral letters, Catholic books, etc., how the belief in our enormous superiority over former times has penetrated the consciousness of Catholics. Are the signs of the times perhaps not clear enough? Do they not speak plainly enough? Indeed, it is inconceivable that our hastening towards destruction is regards as progress, right when we ought to be crying out. Between the four courts and the altars, the priests and ministers of God will weep, and they will cry out, Spare, O Lord, spare thy people. Chapter 5. Is there still a ray of light? Gardini, in his book, The End of the Modern Age, commented on the decline of humanity and conceived of it as the downfall of Western culture. He saw it as an inevitable fate, as a process which we cannot stop. His main concern was how the Church will survive this collapse of mankind, 
in what form and manner. But we would like to emphasize once again in the face of this apocalyptic decline of humanity that it is not an inevitable fate, that it can be avoided with God's help by the free intervention of those who see clearly that mankind is on the precipice, and that it is not, as the false prophet Teilhard de Chardin claimed, moving towards Christ the Omega Point in the magnificent process of evolution. It is high time that an ecology of the spiritual realm, even on the natural level, unmasks this terrible error. But above all, has Christ not redeemed mankind? Can he not halt this hastening towards the precipice? by intervening in a way in which we cannot conceive of, but which we may hope for? And let us not forget how many magnificent things still do exist, that the message of God in the sun-filled heavens and in the beauty of nature still survives. We do not, even today, still meet noble, pure persons, whose being radiates a light which makes us rejoice men in whom a deep faith, a true love for Christ, is alive. Indeed, they are not many saints even today. No, the terrible decline of humanity, the whole advancing dehumanization, should certainly bring the gravity and seriousness of the situation before our eyes, but our response must not be despair, nor even discouragement but rather a strengthened faith, an unconquerable hope, a stronger love, and the knowledge of the superhuman task of the Holy Church to save humanity, or at least her own children, from this downfall. Is our life not a status VA, a state of pilgrimage? Is not hope the only fundamental attitude which is characteristic of our status VA. The essence of the status VA is to be directed towards the point of arrival, the status termini, looking toward this with hope. This upward glance does not make us dull and indifferent to that which occurs in the status VA, and our and to our tasks and duties here. On the contrary, the prospect of eternity, for which we hope, grants us not only true wakefulness to each moment of our lives seriously, but also perspective of the true hierarchy of all natural goods. It is this view of things which protects us from the viewing the horror of the present downfall as something final and inevitable. For the overwhelming reality of eternity gives us strength, courage, and hope to fight against this downfall. And above all, we must pray that humanity, instead of hastening towards the precipice, returns to true values. But this is only possible if the vineyard of the Lord blossoms anew. And therefore we must storm heaven with the prayer that the spirit of St. Pius X might once again fill the hierarchy, and that the word anathema sit might once again ring out against all heretics and especially against all the members of the fifth column within the church. Arise, why dost thou sleep, O Lord? Why dost thou turn thy countenance from us and forget our tribulation? Psalm 43, 23, 25 Yes, let us urgently beseech God that the vineyard of the Lord be restored to its full glory. Let us be filled with the hope which is expressed by the words of Saint Anselm. In thee, O Lord, have I trusted. Let me not be confounded in eternity.
Chapter 6 Is History the Source of Revelation? In my book, The Trojan Horse in the City of God, I spoke of the various ways of idolizing history, whether it be in the form of historical relativism or of a false interpretation of the Kairos. However, we intend here to turn our attention to the form which deifies history by claiming that revelation did not stop with the apostles, but that it continues through and in history. This error is unfortunately widespread today. In it, salvation history is no longer seen in its uniqueness, whereas profane history is placed on the same level as salvation history. Of course, this does not refer to the continuing formulation of the divine reg revelation handed down from the apostles, which goes hand in hand with the condemnation of heresies. This is the development from implicit to explicit, which finds its expression in dogma in the Depositum Catholicae Fidei, the deposit of the Catholic faith. This development occurs under the protection of the Holy Spirit, but this clearly has nothing to do with the course of profane history, and also no new revelation. The claim that the supernatural revelation of God in the strict sense of the word still continues in history is also a failure to recognize the radical differences between the role of history in salvation history and in profane history. One does not notice the difference between what is proper to history as such, which is, and which is ascribed to it as such, such as the imaginary Hegel and world spirit, and unique supernatural intervention at a particular moment in history. The Holy Father gave a clear answer to this question in an audience of January 19, 1972. The question is this, is the contact with God which issues from the Gospel a moment which belongs to the natural development of the human spirit, and is thus a subject to continual change and to being continually surpassed? Or is it a unique and decisive moment in which we can nourish ourselves without ceasing, wherein we nevertheless recognize the essential content that to be unchangeable? The answer is clear. This moment is unique and decisive. That means that revelation has entered time and history. It is a precise datum, tied to a particular event, which must be considered as finished and, for us, completed with the death of the Apostles. Revelation is a fact, an event, but at the same time a mystery which does not spring from the human spirit, but from divine initiative, which was progressively manifested in the course of history throughout the Old Testament, and which reached its high point in Jesus Christ. The Church distinguishes unambiguously and clearly between this unique revelation of Christ, which is finished with the death of the last Apostle, and all private revelations, even when these are recognized as genuine and are distinguished from all pretended or ungenuine private revelations. But these private revelations never refer to dogmatic questions of faith and morals, as does Christian revelation. Many saints and mystics have had visions and dialogues with Christ, for example, St. Gertrude, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Catherine of Siena, St. Francis of Assisi, and St. John of the Cross. But all these refer to unique experiences, to the relationship between the saint and Jesus, or to concrete instructions, but all within the framework of the official Depositum Catholicae Fidei. 
If anything occurred in these private revelations which contradicted the Depositum Catholicae Fidei, the, mystic, the saintly mystics themselves viewed it as a deception. There, but there is no obligation for the Catholic believer to include the content of these private revelations in his faith. Moreover, there are supernatural appearances, such as in Lourdes or Fatima, which are clearly distinguished from all revelation of God in Christ, for this ended with the apostles. There are great miracles, in part miraculous healings, in part supernatural warnings, but they represent no additions whatever to revelation in the strict sense of the word, which terminated with the apostles. The latter apparitions are not private apparitions. As in the case of the holy mystics, for their message were directed to all. The persons who experience them have more the character of a mouthpiece. In Guadalupe, it is a simple Indian who had no other visions or mystical experiences. In Lourdes, a very young girl, Bernadette, in Fatima, children who, while they did become saints, were not typical mystics. Here again it is not a matter of revelation, in the sense of divine revelation, of the content of faith and morals, as is the revelation laid down in the Depositum Catholicae Fidei. But many progressivists view history as revelation in the full sense, as an enlargement and continuation of the revelation of God in Christ through the Apostles. There is talk especially of the revelation through the Holy Spirit in history. This is decidedly false, as expressly marked by the Holy Father, as an error. But it could be objected. The old saying, Vox temporis, vox dei. The, vox of, the voice of the times is the voice of God has real meaning, and can in no way be interpreted as an expression of modern historicism. This saying gives clear expression to the fact that God speaks to us in history, and indeed in the present moment in history. The present epoch thus contained a message from God to men, and this message must be understood and assimilated we must follow the call which lies in this message. To be deaf to this message, so they think, would be very wrong. It would be disobedience to God. This may sound plausible to many people, but as soon as the true meaning of the vox temporis, vox dei, is more carefully analyzed, it becomes quite clear that it means something di completely different than what is meant by the slogan that God reveals himself in history, in the sense discussed above. The Vox Dei refers to special tasks which are assigned to us, but in no way to divine revelation. Of course, the particular age in which we live make special requirements of us. When orders were founded in the Middle Ages to free the Christians who had been captured by Moslems, special historical circumstances contained a call of God to such an undertaking. The splendid relief work done by Father Werenfried van Straten, the so-called Bacon Priest, is a typical response to the awful spiritual and physical need into which have been thrust by the great evil of communism. The appeal of God for this relief work did not exist 100 years ago. 
Each age poses problems which previously had not existed. But the problems are not posed by the spirit of the age, but rather by new facts. The solution of these problems, however, should never come from the spirit of the age, but from the spirit of Christ. The spirit of the age, in the sense of the prevailing ideology, only sets the task of combating the errors which were formerly not influential. Certainly the encouragement of whatever good is to be found in a spirit of the age is a divinely ordained task. But all this clearly has nothing to do with the revelation of God in the sense of the disclosure of the divine mysteries. There is no question of the new truths of faith, but a call to fulfill certain tasks which are presented by the respective era. The Vox Dei, in a particular age, is not revelation in the strict sense of the word. It has no supernatural character. An error also does not teach us principles with regard to moral questions. We are confronted with new tasks in a particular historical situation. The call of God here is to fulfill them. But the epoch does not instruct us about the good and evil. God often calls us precisely to resist these false teachings which present themselves as Christian, according to the words of St. Paul, for the time will come when they will not stand wholesome teaching but will follow their own fancy and gather, gather a crowd of teachers to tickle their ears. They will stop their ears to the truth and turn to mythology. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4 The radical difference between that which is meaningfully expressed by the saying vox temporis, vox dei, and the divine revelation can be clearly seen when they compare profane history with salvation history. The salvation history in the Old Testament contains revelations in the full sense of the word. The revelation of God, whether it be to Abraham or through Moses and the prophets, is a divine intervention at this particular historical moment. This is incomparably more true than the self-revelation of God in Christ. All the deeds of Christ take place in history. But this direct intervention of God in history is separated by an abyss from that which profane history can tell us about God. And especially all the words of Christ are a revelation which took place in history at a particular moment but which themselves as such go completely above and beyond salvation history. Chapter 7 Qui te fecit sine te A dangerous error, which has unfortunately also penetrated into the sanctuary of the church, is the notion of progress unfolding in history in our objective relation to God, wherein it is assumed that God is drawing mankind closer to himself in the course of history without the individual knowing anything about it. This is especially a fruit of Teilhardism. It is very important to understand that no man can attain eternal beatitude without his own cooperation. Que ti fecit sine te, non te justificat sine te, says St. Augustine. He who created you without you does not justify you without you. Even though the cooperation of the individual is only a tiny factor in comparison with the infinite mercy of God, the redemption through Christ's death on the cross, the reception of sanctifying grace at baptism, 
Nevertheless, this cooperation with grace, obedience to the commandment of God, faith, hope, love, the imitation of Christ, is a factor of decisive importance. The Gospel leaves no room for doubt that God treats man as a partner and that our behavior, our response, plays a decisive role in the, our sanctification and through it in the glorification of God and finally in our eternal beatitude. Christ said, Truly, I say unto you, if your justice is not greater than that of the scribes and Pharisees, you will not enter the kingdom of heaven. Further, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but those who do the will of my Father who is in heaven. It is obviously impossible to enumerate all the passages in the Gospels which point out the importance of our obedience to the commandments of God and of our love of God and neighbor. This is indeed the meaning and the essence of revelation, that God speaks to us as persons, and as persons we thereby become acquainted with supernatural truth and give the response which God wishes us to give to this truth, our faith. It also belongs to the meaning of revelation that we become acquainted with the commandments of God and obey them. It belongs to the meaning of the revelation in the God-man, Jesus Christ, that his adorable holiness shine resplendent upon us, and that we follow and imitate him. Faith, hope, and love should blossom in us, and all that requires, apart from the gift of grace, the communication of the divine principle of life in baptism, our free co cooperation. We do not, therefore, reach eternal beatitude without having anything to do with it. When we think of all the other creatures, such as plants and animals, we realize that everything happens to and through them without their free cooperation. They are not personal creatures. A revelation to them would have no point. They possess neither the capacity for true knowledge and true understanding, which belongs to man alone as a person, nor do they have a free will. Now it is important to understand which things, even in human life, issue from God alone without man's cooperation which things require free cooperation. Qui fecit te senete, says St. Augustine. That we exist, our life as persons, that we possess the capacity for knowledge and freedom of will, and all these are pure gifts of God which we receive. There it would have no meaning to speak of our cooperation. The action of providence in our lives is also completely independent of us. When a person thinks of all the circumstances of his life, of all the situations into which he has been led without having had a hand in the matter, he catches a glimpse of an enormous network of things, which came into being without his assistance which parents he had, which brothers and sisters, in which environment he was allowed to grow up, how he is physically put together, whether he is infected during an epidemic or not, whether he meets persons of whom he had previously known nothing, but who afterwards play a decisive role in his life. In the entire dominion of providence we are dealing with the pure dispensations of God, in which no cooperation is present on our part, and which are forthcoming without our playing a conscious part in them. The special graces which God gives the individual person are also pure gifts. It is impossible to treat in detail here everything in our lives which is a pure gift from God, 
in the sense that it represents itself without our knowledge and without our cooperation. There would naturally be many levels to distinguish here. They are, for instance, many things which lie completely beyond our power, which, in principle, occur without our having anything to do with the occurring and others, which, in principle, can come about through their, our cooperation, for example, an encounter with other persons, as when one expressly seeks someone whom one has heard of. We could also distinguish the things which, though they are pure gifts, still come into our experience, such as the inspiration of an artist, a great love for a particular person, the grace to feel the presence of God, to experience a burning, ardent love for Christ. These are all gifts, but not things which happen without our having anything to do with their coming to us. And besides, these are many gifts which appeal to us for a right response. The main distinction is perhaps here. Which things occur with our without our having anything to do with their occurring, which only intrude into our conscious life when they are fully real. Consider, for example, a sickness which develops for a long time unnoticed, or numerous occurrences in our bodies. Everything which invades our consciousness, though it take place without us and our cooperation, is nevertheless known by us, addresses itself to our consciousness, and, what is more, appeals to us for a response. But we cannot go into further detail here concerning this problem, which is most interesting in itself. For us, the decisive fact is that there is no morality without our free cooperation and that nobody can partake of eternal beatitude without his own cooperation. And indeed, that the revelation of God must be heard and grasped, that it addresses itself to our consciousness, and is an appeal for our cooperation, a cooperation which is required for sanctity and eternal beatitude, which brings fear and trembling over us. The notion that in the course of history humanity is being drawn nearer to God by progress in history is based on a Hegelian effort which we discussed in detail in the Trojan Horse. We are never drawn nearer to God without our having anything to do with it and without our noticing it. Every instance of being drawn nearer to God is something which can only have reference to the individual. It may refer to many individuals at the same time, but never to humanity or to a community. Here, too, we encounter the Hegelian error of depersonalization, of the primacy of the community over the individual person, which leads him, for example, to regard the state as a higher entity than, di than the individual person. Here an especially dangerous invasion of Hegelian historicism presents itself. The notion that being drawn nearer to God takes place through the alleged progress in history over our head, as it were. Chapter 8 The Great Disappointment At the Second Vatican Council there was much discussion, full of hope, of a great renewal of religion, which would be deepened and divested of any purely conventional acc accretions. But if someone were to regard with an unprejudiced mind the Church of today, and compare it with the Church of 1956, what would strike him? Changes, surely, but he would search in vain for renewal and deepening of faith in the revelation of Christ. 
as it is laid down in the Depositum Catholicae Fidei, the deposit of Catholic faith, and for a more vital life in Christ, a more living imitation of Christ. Nuns who formerly even by their habits radiated a life completely consecrated to God, and withdrawn from all that is worldly, now confront us in makeup and many skirts. In many places the Holy Mass is celebrated with jazz and with all kinds of rock and roll music. But even in many churches where the Holy Mass is correctly celebrated, we see the faithful standing to receive Holy Communion. Why, one asks oneself, has kneeling been replaced by standing? Is not kneeling the classical expression of adoration? It is in no way limited to being the noble expression of petition, of supplication. It is also the typical expression of reverent submission, of subordination, of looking upwards. And above all, it is the expression of the humble confrontation of the Absolute Lord, Adoration. Chesterton said that a man does not realize how great he is on his knees. Indeed, man is never more beautiful than in the humble attitude of kneeling, turning towards God. So why replace this by standing? Should kneeling perhaps be prohibited because it evokes associations with feudal times, because it is no longer fitting for democratic modern man? Does religious renewal perhaps consist in becoming a victim to purely associative thinking, a clear sign of stupidity? Does religious renewal lie in suffering from an unfortunate case of sociologitis, which nonsensically wants to deduce fundamental human phenomena from a particular historical epoch and kind of mentality? And why can the faithful no longer kneel beside one another at the communion rail, which is, after all, a great expression of community? Why must they march up to the altar goose-step fashion? Is this supposed to correspond to the meal character of the Holy Communion, which is stressed so frequently, better than kneeling together in a recollected way? Unfortunately, in many places communion is distributed in the hand. To what extent is this supposed to be a renewal and a deepening of the reception of Holy Communion? Is the trembling reference with which we receive this incomprehensible gift, perhaps increased by receiving it in our unconsecrated hands, rather than from the consecrated hand of a priest? It is not difficult to see that the danger of parts of the consecrated host falling to the ground is incomparably increased, and the danger of desecrating it, or indeed of horrible blasphemy, is very great. And what in the world is supposed to be gained by all this? The claim that the contact with the hand makes the host more real is certainly pure nonsense. For the theme here is not the reality of the manner of the host, but rather the consciousness, which is only attainable by faith, that the host in reality becomes the body of Christ. The reverent reception of the body of Christ on our tongues from the consecrated hand of the priest is much more conducive to the strengthening of this consciousness than reception with our own unconsecrated hands. Sight, touch, and taste would err about thee, but through hearing alone we are given certain faith, says Thomas Aquinas in his magnificent hymn, Adoro Te. Or is it perhaps the crude error that through the imitation of the external customs of the first Christians, we could regain the faith of these Christians. These customs were good at that time because an unshakable heroic faith was present, 
a faith which confessed Christ at the risk of death. Certain forms were possible at a time when the opposition between sacred and profane was so lively, but the simple reintroduction of these forms could never rejuvenate the faith of a conventional or modernistic Catholic, or make him more reverent. But, many will object, the character of the meal is thereby strengthened. But is Holy Communion the moment to play-act and to imitate a meal, which is a holy meal, and in any case completely different from a real meal, rather than to focus on the unspeakable mystery of the love union of our souls with Jesus, and through this with all the faithful? And the real imitation of a meal which takes the form of a breakfast is a blasphemy, as every rational man must see. It is, thank God, not yet officially permitted, but unfortunately it occurs over and over again. Incidentally, the communion in the hand is permitted in many countries, but it is in no way recommended by Rome. Much more serious yet is the unfortunate mutilation of the liturgical year and the Holy Mass in the Nor New Ordo. Is our faith supposed to be renewed and vivified by greatly weakening our sense of community with Christians of former times, a community which is so centrally important for the true Christian ethos? Is it perhaps believed that the community with the living, with contemporaries, becomes stronger by weakening the community with the saints of former times? Quite the opposite is true. The Christian community, the supernatural community, is necessarily extended into the present and the past. This is precisely a particular characteristic of this supernatural community, which distinguishes it from all purely natural and humanitarian kinds of community. The real, experienced union with the saints of former times is a specific manifestation of true faith a breakthrough to valid, supernatural reality. It has found its glorious expression in the celebration of the Feast of the Saints, in which the saint of the day was not only mentioned in the collect and post-communion, as is now the case, but in which his figure was luminously prominent in the wonderful construction of the whole Holy Mass. In the text of the introit, and the gradual, in the choice of the epistle and the gospel. Let us think, for example, of the feasts of St. Francis of Assisi, St. Martin, St. Agnes, St. Ag Andrew, and above all the feast of the conversion of St. Paul, the feasts of St. Peter and Paul, in order to see that the liturgy knew how to bring us completely into an intimate union with these individual saints. Let us think of the role of the saints in the Tridentine confetor and companion. One accused oneself before God, the Blessed Virgin, and the whole heavenly court. One was conscious of deep community with them. One made this self-accusation before God in the supernatural world, in which alone one can be simultaneously sheltered in an intimate and personal way, and present in a holy public realm. Some of this has disappeared. Some has been placed completely in the background in favor of an emphasis on more or less accidental parish community. The new liturgy was simply not formed by saints, homines religiosi, and artistically gifted men, but has been worked out by so-called experts, who are not at all aware that in our time there is a lack of talent for such things. Today is a time of incredible talent for technology and medical research but not for the organic shaping of the expression of the religious world. We live in a world without poetry, 
and this means that one should approach the treasures handed on from more fortunate times with twice as much reverence, and not with the illusion that we can do it better ourselves. The so-called renewal of the liturgy has robbed us of any possibility of a true participation in the liturgical year. In the Tridentine Mass, one experienced in a living way Advent, Christmas, Epiphany, Septua Gesima, Lent and Passion Week, the Resurrection of Christ, the Glorious Easter Season, the Ascension of Christ, the anticipation of the Holy Spirit, and the blissful peace, feast of Pentecost. How significant was each part in the structure of the Mass? The introit, the epistle, the gospel of the peace, feast in which being celebrated. What a role the celebration of the feasts played. The entire Meaningful dimension of celebration fostered true community in Christ, in which we all have a share in the holy joy. Godia, Godiamus omnes in domino diem festum celebrantes. Let us all rejoice who celebrate this festive day in the Lord. With the disappearance of this celebration, we find that listening has disappeared. This holy stillness within our souls, however, is necessary in order to let the word of God radiate in our souls, and then to let us participate in the inconceivable mystery of the sacrifice of Christ, and afterwards to receive ourselves, Lord Jesus, our Lord in Beatitude. The new liturgy is without splendor, flattened, and undifferentiated. It no longer draws us into the true experience of the liturgical year. We are deprived of this experience through the catastrophic elimination of the hierarchy of feasts, octaves, many great feasts of saints, and through the practice in the remaining feasts of saints of remembering the saint only in the collect and post-communion. Truly, if one of the devils in C.S. Lewis's The Screwtape Letters had been entrusted with the ruin of the liturgy, he could not have done it better. In place of the deep expression which even makes use of our bodily postures, sitting for the epistle in the offertory, standing for the gloria, the gospel, the credo, and kneeling in adoration, we now have a continual up and down which works against recollection. How was the idea behind lengthening the liturgy of the Word, the Mass of the Catechumens, on Sunday, and in many instances also on weekdays, in shortening the actual sac sacrificium? What a mistake to believe that in the instructive part, a large portion of the Old Testament must be read in that all four Gospels must be proclaimed one right after the other. Is not the function of the reading and the Gospel in the Holy Mass a completely different one from merely publicizing the Old and New Testaments? The reading of the Bible cannot be recommended enough. Bible study evenings where the priest and the faithful read texts from the Old and the whole of the New Testament, would certainly help bring about more intimate knowledge of the Word of God. But in the Holy Mass, whose focal point is the Holy Sacrifice, through which God is infinitely glorified, together with Holy Communion, the reading and the proclamation of the Gospel do not have an instructive function but rather serve the, the spiritual preparation of the souls for the sacrifice of, and communion. The attitude which is fitting here for these readings is not that of learning, but that of reverently letting the light of revelation shine upon us, especially such parts of it have a special relation to the feast which is being celebrated. A unique character of the feast 
be it Christmas, Epiphany, the Ascension, or the Immaculate Conception of Mary, is closely bound to the choice of the reading, be they from the Old Testament or from the letters of the Apostles, or from the Gospels. Instead of this, an organic structure of the feasts is destroyed and replaced by a mechanical principle of having the Gospels of M Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John follow each other in sequence, so that in the course of three years all four Gospels will be read in their entirety. The Universal Latin which throughout so many ages was the sacred language of the Roman Catholic Church, has been replaced by the vernacular, and the quality of the vernacular translations have rendered it more difficult to be drawn into the sacral world of the supernatural, and have confined us within a banal world. What should be said of the de facto abolition of Gregorian chant, this glorious timeless voice of the church, which has almost the character of a sacramental. Have all these changes served the renewal and vivification of faith? The opposite is the case. Vocations to the priesthood, as well as conversions, have greatly decreased, and attendance of Catholic at Mass has greatly fallen off. The new order misse which, most especially the reform of the liturgy of the feasts and of the whole liturgical year, is so colorless, inorganic, and artificial, that it will not be able to last long. What a sacred world was radiated in the organic structure and beauty of both the Tridentine Mass, which had already been used in its essential elements long before its official introduction, and the structuring of the feast days, the feasts of our Lord, of the Mother of God, of the great special feasts of the Saint, and even of the Commune Sectorum. This was all especially beautiful in combination with Gregorian chant. Present in this liturgy was thus a vitality and a power to live so that throughout the centuries it lost none of its surprising depth and beauty. But these things disappear in the new liturgy. We are therefore justified in hoping that this liturgy will be short-lived. Indeed, its failure from a pastoral viewpoint is a further sign that we are justified in this hope. So we can expect that the Church in the foreseeable future will return to the glorious Mass of St. Pius V and the magnificent arrangement of the whole liturgical year and all the changeable parts of the Holy Mass. But, despite the grave effects, defects of this new Mass, it would, of course, be completely wrong in any way to question its validity as a reenactment of the sacrifice of Calvary, as, unfortunately, so f some few Orthodox Catholics have. And it goes without saying that it would be completely wrong to disobey any of the rulings of the Holy Father regarding, regarding the Nor Novus Ordo and the Tridentine Liturgy. The passage from Vatican I quoted in footnote 78a regarding the obedience which Catholics owe the Pope even in these practical manners where they are entitled to disagree with the judgment of the Pope. Turning to a different subject, promiscuity, even among Catholics, has increased in a horrifying manner. Certain Catholic universities, as mentioned above, have even become places of shameless public indecency, and many of the professors, both priests and religious, not only teach things which are completely incompatible with the dogmatic teaching of the Church, but also defend promiscuity. Where is the promised renewal? We have to consider yet another respect in which the hope of renewal has 
been disappointed. Many had hoped, through the Second Vatican Council, a conquest of mediocrity would go hand in hand with the freeing of the religious life from all merely conventional elements. Were not many bishops, and especially many priests and pastors, mediocre? It was believed that this mediocrity was due to the narrowness of the ceremon seminaries, to isolation from the world, in a word, to the fact that the church had withdrawn into a ghetto. But with what success have we burst out of our so-called narrowness? What we encounter in theological books, essays, and sermons is not only a spirit of irreverence, and of apostasy, but also a deeply oppressive mediocrity. Mediocrity is well known to be more fatal the more the mediocre person believes himself to be intelligent, interesting, novel. The more he regards revolutionary and mediocre as radical opposites. Certainly there has always been mediocre bishops, priests and theologians in the history of the church, they were not homines religiosi. They did not radiate the spirit of the Holy Church in their personalities. They were intellectually insignificant, and when they wrote books or gave sermons, their manner of presenting the sublime teaching of the Holy Church was mediocre, even if well-intentioned. But their sermons, pastoral letters, and books contained no heresies, and if they did contain them, they were immediately disavowed by the higher authorities. Thus even these mediocre figures in the church remained spokesmen for the church and her true teaching. But the mediocrity which is devastating the vineyard of the Lord today does not only refer to personality, but also to the content of what is being propagated. Since many are no longer functioning objectively as the spokesmen for the teachings of the Holy Church, although they pass themselves off as such, but rather proclaim the fruits of their own thought in place of the Depositum Catholicae Fidei, the content of their teaching is also filled with mediocrity. The fact that they are allowed to do this unhindered signifies a triumph of mediocrity within the church which formerly did not exist. A cancerous damage is being caused by the whole program of renewal because it deliberately builds on experimentation. The childish, primitive idolization of science has awakened in many the notion that one should ascertain even in the pastoral realm, by conducting experiments, what has stronger effects, what attracts people, etc. But the experiment, which is so completely appropriate in the realm of natural science, is not fruitful, nor even possible, in philosophy, and especially not in our practical life. One cannot make experiments with souls. One cannot make experiments in the pastoral realm. The proclamation of the revelation of Christ cannot be changed in order to ascertain by experiment what is more attractive. The pastoral sphere cannot be separated from the nature of the content of revelation nor from the essence of the human soul. It cannot be separated from that which it should be. It must never be made into a purely psychological concern. The experimental, neutral attitude is incompatible with pastoral attitude. The ultimate seriousness with which the immortal soul is taken in every true apostolate is the opposite of the neutral attitude towards an object which one experiments with. This wretched idolatry of the experiment has penetrated deeply into the church. 
it has affected those in positions of authority less in what they recommend than in what they permit. The slogan of experimentation is the key to get permission to undertake everything imaginable. The experimental frame of mind nourishes the illusion that one is renewing the church, that one is freeing oneself from all conventionalization of faith, although this attitude is from the outset incompatible with all true religious attitudes, and is itself much worse than all conventionalization, which is, of course, regrettable. Let us think of the genuine renewal and of the true blossoming of faith and of Catholic life, which developed in France at the beginning of the century, at the time of Léon Bloy, Claudel Pégoy, James, Maritain, Sichari, and many others, of the religious flourishing even in the working class, of the time when Pope St. Pius X called forth a true renewal of the liturgy through an encyclical and through his glorious war against modernism. Then it can only sound ironic to speak of the renewal, deepening, revitalization of faith and the Christian life through Vatican II. There may be well have been many things in need of reform before the Council, in comparison of the Church in the year 1956 and in 1972, compels one to say with the psalmist, By the rivers of Babylon we sat and wept when we remember Zion. Psalm 136